Well, good evening, everyone. I see our participant list here growing um, by the second. Um, as soon as we get to five o'clock, we'll, we'll start the meeting, okay? Which is coming very shortly here. All right, I'm gonna get us started on time here. Well, welcome everybody. Um, looks like we have 31 participants and 25 attendees. We're very excited to have you join us this evening. This is our annual meeting where we talk about the activities that we've done with, with, uh, as they relate to prairie dog management in the last year. So we're excited that you've joined us and, and wanna hear about our activities. And then um, the last part of the meeting, we're gonna uh, start a discussion about our uh, um, lethal control moratorium. And we're very excited to get your comments about, um, about that topic as well. So tonight, um, I'm gonna lead us off. I'm Jeff Moline. I'm the um, planning manager for Boulder County Parks and Open Space. And um, we're gonna have two other speakers this evening. Uh, next, following me will be Rob Alexander. He's our, um, a, our senior ag resources specialist. And then following him will be Susan Spaulding. And she is our um, senior wildlife biologist specialist. So those will be the three speakers. And then we also have Amy Schwartz, one of our resource technicians on hand along with uh, Mike Foster, our agricultural division manager, and they'll be assisting answering questions this evening. So obviously, as you know, you've um, joined us virtually. So this is a virtual meeting. It is being recorded. And um, there is a Q&A feature and feel free to ask questions in there. We're going to break up the presentation today the first part, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about our activities from 2021, and then we'll break and have some questions, and we'll be able to both answer questions that are in that Q&A, and then um, as well, I'll be able to uh, um, elevate people to ask their questions live this afternoon or this evening as well. So we'll have that, and then we'll, um, after that session of questions, we'll go into the discussion about the um, lethal control moratorium, and then at the end of the meeting, we'll have questions about that. So that's where we're headed. Um, during the question times, if you wanna speak uh, at the meeting, instead of using the Q&A feature, uh, just raise your hand and then I'll be able to elevate you uh, so that you can ask your question. And we'll, we'll go over that again when we get to that time. Um, okay, with that, we're gonna get started. And, uh, oh, you know, the one other thing, um, when we get to the question section, uh, it's our, our staff just appreciate it if you let us know your name and then where you live, your hometown. You don't have to give us an address. This isn't a quasi-judicial proceeding or anything, but it's helpful for us to, to just know where people are um, calling in from. So with that, we'll get started. I'm, um, I think the next slide, Susan, is our... Uh, Tonight's agenda, I'm gonna kick things off with an introduction and just provide a little bit of context for our policy, go over, um, and then we'll be, then we'll start heading into the, the activities for 2021. You can see Rob will be speaking, what he'll be speaking about, what Susan will be speaking about, and then those questions. And then again, the consideration of the lethal control moratorium. So let's go to the next slide, Susan. So um, what is it that governor, governs the way our department manages prairie dogs? Well, next slide. It's, uh, as many of you know, probably, it's our prairie dog management plan. Uh, this is a plan that's available on the web. It's a component of our uh, grassland and shrubland management policy. Next slide. And it was, it's a plan that, um, that we're rather proud of, I, I, I would say. It was a plan that was originally approved in 1999, as you can see. And one of the things that we've been able to do with the community and with the support of our elected officials is modify it. Um, let it it's almost become kind of an iterative plan. It's evolved to take into consideration sort of specific 
uh, incidents or, or um, situations, I guess I'd say. And so um, we feel like it's a, it's a good plan and it has allowed us to generally be successful at um, managing prairie dogs over this last 22 years. Um, the, as you can imagine, we have a full range of properties, a full range of issues across our program. And so the plan needs to um, address and, and um, apply to a full range of those issues. Next slide, Susan. And so what are the goals? What are the overall goals of that prairie dog management plan? Well, it reflects the values of our county and, and our residents. And so one of the goals is to make sure that we have croplands um, for our, the agricultural component of our program, of course. And then um, another part of it, of course, is the, the stewardship of natural areas and systems. And so while these can seem to be uh, almost contradictory things, Really what our plan allows us to do is address these things simultaneously on different properties. Next slide. Um, and I'll get into that in a second, but one of the things that comes up for people uh, in past meetings, people have said, well, is there a way that you could just turn your whole program into grassland and not do agriculture anyway, anymore? And um, we can't. Uh, the, the mission of Boulder County Parks and Open Space, as you can see there, you can, you can read it, but it involves natural, cultural, and agricultural resources. And the goals for our department include providing and promoting sustainable agriculture. So um, this is, um, like I said, promoting and providing for agriculture is a core part of our mission. And so, we need to have this plan to help us address both agricultural properties along with our natural um, properties that we let natural systems uh, and ecosystem processes take place. So now let's go to the next slide. So again, we so, so I've sort of set out this scenario where we have these this variety of interest in our program. We have agricultural interests, natural resource interests, cultural resource interests. And then of course we have a wide spectrum of properties. And so next slide. Um, so the way we do that to cover our entire uh, open space system that has prairie dogs on it. Next slide. Is we organize our properties into these designations. And so all of our properties that have prairie dogs on them have been categorized into these um, designations. So we have habitat conservation areas, HCAs, we refer to them as. Those are areas where we are actively encouraging natural systems, natural processes to take place. And in those situations, we really are looking to um, keep prairie dogs a vital part of those landscapes. In multiple objective areas, those are often areas that are um, sort of border areas where we might be trying to do several different things with a particular property. We may need to go in and do uh, more management than we do in, in some places. Um, and so we don't have a lot of these multiple objective areas but they do give us some flexibility in management. So uh, that's another one of our three categories. And then finally is our no prairie dog areas. And these are areas where we've really prioritized the agricultural use of a particular property. And um, next slide. So what you can see with this uh, graphic and map here is th this is a snapshot of the plains portion of our county. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through the, the, the legend here and what you're seeing on the screen. So there's basically, there's two categories of land showing up here. There's the green Boulder County open space. So that's, we have 66,619 um, 66, acres of county open space that we own and, um, and manage. Of that 600, excuse me, 66,000 um, total acreage, 17,000, you can see from the slide here, 17,198 acres is, falls into this no prairie dog uh, category. 
And so that is the properties in this image here that are shown in that light pink, all right? And then the uh, next two categories are areas where there's colonies, okay? Where there are active prairie dog colonies, and that's something that um, we annually confirm where we have prairie dog colonies on our, on our properties. And so the orange is highlighting prairie dog colonies where they occur on those HCA and MOA categories. And then the red are the colonies on our no prairie dog areas, NPDs. And then in the key down here, you can see the acreage. So we have um, 768 acres of colonies on areas where we're trying not to have prairie dogs. And then we have 2,820 acres um, on our uh, multiple objective areas and our HCAs. And so the thing I would draw your attention to is th this is just a nice map of our county. Um, if you look to the north, on the north side of this map, you can see our large open space properties, Heil Ranch, Hall Ranch, and Rabbit Mountain. Um, one of the things that I need to also mention about this exhibit is that it's displaying all of our open space in green, but not all of those lands, as, as you probably know, are suitable for prairie dogs. Um, and so, you know, when you look at Hall and Heil, there's only small areas of prairie dogs because there's just not a lot of suitable habitat for them on some of those properties. Now, when you look at Rabbit Mountain in the center um, upper portion of the map, you can see we have many uh, acres of prairie dogs in that area. And so um, what, this, what this map shows is just sort of the, the areas of on, on county open space where we have active colonies. And as I mentioned, 2,800 acres are in those MOA and HCA categories and 768 are on the areas that we classify as NPD. Let's go to the next slide now, Susan. And this just shows a, a, a close up of that. Um, and you can see in places where we have the green sort of in the center of the screen there, um, those are probably multiple objective areas where we're trying to manage some resources next to some active ag. But then if you look at, um, again, in the, the upper center of the image, you're gonna be in the Rabbit Mountain area. And most of that is gonna be on habitat conservation areas. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so again, just to kind of um, to discuss the, the no prairie dog acreages. And this is, um, Rob Alexander will be following me here after this slide. And um, this is where most of our management occurs is on these acres where we're uh, trying to remove the, the prairie dogs from our agricultural property. So again, we have this 1700 acres of, of um, 1700, 200 acres of excuse me, 17,200 acres of NPD lands, of which, if you recall, there was 700 some acres of, of prairie dogs, so 4% occupied. Um, so that's a brief summary of our policy, um, how that plays out into the management of our lands. And with that, I am gonna turn this, I think the next slide is Rob's. It is. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Um, again, my name is Rob Alexander. I work for the Agricultural Resources Division. And uh, my role in prairie dog management is that I supervise the on the ground removal uh, on our NPD properties. So we have a, a crew that does the removal. Um, uh, we, I think many of you are familiar that um, we do removal by um, primarily lethal control is done by compressed carbon monoxide. We do use cartridges, carbon monoxide cartridges. Um, Susan, can you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Um, and we, we do live trapping. And so this slide is a summary of the removal activities and more or less quantifies um, our efforts in 2021. So as you can see, um, we removed, a removal occurred on 41 NPD properties. And those are primarily, I would say, 
easily over 95%, maybe 99% on agricultural lands. Of the 17,000 acres and some odd that Jeff was talking about that are NPDs, uh, 13,000 of those are um, ag lands. The balance are non-ag lands. So most of this occurred on uh, that 13,000 acres of, of NPD. So 41 different properties. Um, our tenants are permitted uh, through a process where we um, train them and give them permits that outline where they can and cannot do removal. You can see they did uh, uh, removal on 19 different properties. Overall, 29,678 burrows were treated with one method or the other. And you can see the, uh, the breakdown by method. Um, we re removed prairie dogs from 318 acres that were on, again, those NPD properties. And all of these were, were agricultural properties. We, we, over the years, we've done less and less trapping, live trapping, um, but we still do live trapping. It does still play a role in our removal efforts. You can see just, just under 1,500 animals were, were live trapped. Um, They're then euthanized, and uh, some of the animals go to the Black-Footed Ferret Recovery Program and uh, to, to support the raising of ferrets in that facility. And then not approximately 900 go to the Raptor Rehabilitation Center in, uh, in Bluefield to support their program. Um, next slide, Jeff. So I, if you looked at the overall map of the county that Jeff presented to show where uh, kind of the juxtaposition of agricultural properties and where we have prairie dogs on colonies. This was kind of that central uh, blog, big red blob uh, in the center of that map. And this is the what we refer to as the AHI complex, um, a large complex of properties consisting of suits, um, AHI, loggerman, uh, uh, AHI, Longmont Farms, and, and the IMO property. So, one of our strategies has been for several years is to keep up our efforts to, to remove and, uh, and clear and, and try to prevent prairie dogs from um, recolonizing the areas that we've already cleared. This map kind of shows the progress that we've made on this complex. We've gone over this in the past several years and I thought folks would be interested to see uh, what's going on here, because there are some interesting things going on. Um, so you can see the figures by acreages and how the colonies have fluctuated. And you can see, if you look at Lagerman Reservoir is that, uh, that largest body of water um, kind of in the central part of the complex. You can see that in 2018, um, East of Lagerman Reservoir was completely cleared. And the whole entire east part of the IMO property, which is north of Lagerman Reservoir, was completely cleared. By 2020, you can see that we lost some ground. Those areas were recolonized. Um, and then by 2021, we had to re. Um, uh, remove the colonies from those areas again. And um, the bottom line is you can see that it, between 2018, 2021, we had a net reduction of 288 acres of colony on this complex. But we had to remove 723 removal occurred on 723 acres. So you can see that we lost some ground. This is part of the reason that we're um, uh, 
looking into uh, eliminating our pro the proposal to eliminate the moratorium is to prevent this uh, or, or to help reduce this ground that we lose during March, April, and May. Um, Jeff, I think that's all okay. I have. That's that is great, Rob. We're getting some questions, and so we're able, we've been able uh, through our Q and A uh feature here so we've answered some there might be a couple that you might be able to answer here and um and then we've also offered to answer some live during our question period so but with that let's let's let susan do her presentation and then we'll break more formally uh and and tackle um some of the questions so okay. yeah thank you okay Thank you. I'm Susan Spaulding. I'm a senior wildlife biologist with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. So tonight I'm going to be giving you um, an overview of colonized acres of prairie dogs on HCAs and MOAs, barrier fencing projects for 2021, burrowing owl status, and our black-footed ferret reintroduction goal status. Okay, so here you see our acreage totals of active colonies within HCAs and MOAs. The second column shows how much suitable habitat we have within our designated MOAs and HCAs. So we've had small growth overall in HCA and MOA categories since 2017. However, we had a decrease in colony size in 2021 a little bit, which I will outline later. Okay, so here's the same information in graph form, but with data back to 2001. So this table is just for our HCAs, and many of you have seen this before, but from the high levels of colonization in 2004 across our properties, we had plague show up in 2005 and work its way south through the county to the South County grasslands by 2008. So that means it hit Rabbit Mountain and the South County grasslands in about a four year period. So since then, we've seen significant recovery and the recovery continued through 2020. However, you'll see that we lost about 400 acres of colony size across our HCAs in 2021. And again, I'll detail this a little later, but the loss was mainly at Rock Creek Farm in the southeast corner of Boulder County, and some of it was in the South County grasslands in the south central part of the county. And ironically, we think it was due to the high precipitation we experienced this spring, but again, we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so here's the MOA graph. We've seen a similar decrease in colonies on MOAs too. The reasoning is similar to what occurred on our HCAs. And again, we'll talk about that a little later. And these are just HCA and MOA colonized acres combined. Um, again, this illustrates that they had similar losses across those two designation types. Okay, so next I'll talk about barrier fencing. So each year I give an update on how much barrier fencery we've installed during the year. So this is a non-lethal method we use to mitigate conflicts with agricultural operations, neighbors, or other open space areas. We typically do cost sharing when these barriers are associated with neighbor conflicts. So we worked with neighbors in 2021 and installed a total of 650 feet of barrier fencing. So 350 feet of this was on the west side of HI, and 300 feet was adjacent to suits, which is also basically in the AHI complex. So these barriers were done with cost sharings in both cases. So we purchased materials and the neighbors installed the fencing. So in this year, the agricultural group installed 6,475 feet of barrier fencing to mitigate agricultural conflicts. So one and a quarter miles. So these were installed on our Elliott, Lagerman and Autry properties. The Achi property was a cost share with the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks. Um, OSMP purchased the materials and the Prairie Dog crew and the Ag staff installed it. Okay, so next I'll give an overview of our burrowing owl program in 2021. Our subspecies of burrowing owls are dependent on prairie dog burrows for nesting. They're listed as state threatened and they are a priority species of special concern for the county and for our wildlife program. So again, they represent one of the main focus species for our program. 
So here's the nesting success for Boulder County and the city of Boulder OSMP since 2008. And you'll see that 2021 was a sort of moderately successful year. The numbers for 2021 reflect two nests on Boulder County open space, which fledged a total of seven young. And the city of Boulder OSMP had two nests, which fledged a total of one young. I'm just gonna let you guys look at that for a second. Okay, so when we have nesting burrowing owls, we implement protection measures, including temporary trail closures and protection plans. So in order to find the owls in the first place though, we have a robust monitoring program that we started in 2008 in a collaborative partnership with Boulder County Nature Association. So this program has grown over the years and during 2021, 29 volunteers devoted 685 total hours to attending the annual trainings, conducting surveys and data compilation efforts. We definitely need this level of effort to monitor all of our prairie dog colonies for owls, including our NPDs, as there's no way we could do this with only staff. And we remain very grateful to our excellent monitors. They do a wonderful job. Okay, so as I mentioned, if we have nest nesting owls on areas with agricultural leases, we implement owl protection plans. So wildlife staff works in close coordination, wildlife staff and ag staff works in close coordination with the tenants in these cases. So in 2021, we had two nests on leased properties and our tenants were very accommodating and appreciated the direct line of communications and frequent updates on how the owls were faring. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about our progress and status toward potential black-footed ferret reintroductions. And as a quick overview, in order to host self-sustaining populations of wild ferrets, which is 20 females and 10 males, we will need a total of 1,500 acres of active prey dog colonies. This number is based on the home range of a female ferret, which requires 75 acres of active prey dogs uh, to survive and to raise young. And these 1,500 acres have to be um, in relation to each other, not spread across the county. Okay, so in order to grow our colonies to reach 1,500 acres, we've been implementing plague control measures. Plague represents the greatest impact to prey dogs and ferrets, so we need to mitigate this threat. The first method that we used is Delta dust. It's an insecticide that controls the fleas that carry the invasive non-native bacteria that causes plague. So all acres of the South County grasslands and about a third of Rabbit Mountain were dusted in 2021. Um, and we're developing a long-term strategy for dusting at Rabbit Mountain. The staff required to dust all the acres there is very intensive and time consuming. So we're attempting to dust about a third of the acres annually and we will rotate every third year. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. So the second method we use is SPV, the Sylvatic Plague Vaccine. So in 2021, SPV was di distributed on all of the colonies within our properties at the South Kenny Grasslands and Rabbit Mountain. And you can see here the total acres in each one of those HCA complexes. Um, and of course, sustaining healthy populations of prairie dogs helps many associated species, including raptors, coyotes, bobcats, badgers, 13 line ground squirrels, and many others. Okay, so this slide gives a summary of what this effort entails and the associated costs since we started our plague abatement program in 2016. So it requires significant funding, but also many hours of labor to implement. So again, I'm gonna give you a second to look at all this. There's a lot of information on this slide. Susan, while, while we're letting people do that, one of the questions um, we got was when, when we started doing um, the dusting and is, is 2016 when we started doing that or had we been doing it before? No, we started dusting in 2016. Okay. Basically with, in conjunction with our SPV. And in 2016, we were one of the only agencies using SPV at that time. It was pretty new. Um, mm -hmm. so we, were, we were sort of a, a pilot and we were happy to be part of that program. And so since then it's grown and SPV is kind of more commonly used now. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm bringing up this image of the South Central Grasslands HCA and um, 
It's to remind you of what the area looks like in the, event, the general vicinity. Um, we are working with the city of Boulder and us together in this area. Um, it's owned by both of us and it comprises 6,700 acres in total, you can see within the black outlined area. Um, so at our highest level of prairie dog occupancy between both agencies, we had 1,600 acres of active prairie dogs here. Um, currently there's about 175 active acres. So we have a long way to go. Um, also for clarification, remember that not all of those 6,700 acres is suitable habitat for prairie dogs. They would never occupy the entire area as they don't like slopes more than 20% or they don't, there are certain soil profiles that they don't, they can't burrow into. So basically we have about 1,800 acres of suitable habitat within this overall area. Um, we know that because we have a habitat model that we've created based on soil profiles and slope and riparian corridors and that we pull out all that non-suitable habitat to come up with where they will actually live on our property. Okay, so I brought this up again. You guys have seen this in the past, but I just wanted to point out that the city of Boulder open space, Boulder County open space and Rocky Flats to the south combined is about 14,000 acres. Um, so that's the larger landscape and it's very promising for ferrets in the long term. Um, so again, once we encourage our prairie dog populations to be large and healthy enough, it'll definitely be a great place for ferrets. Plus we are excited to have the partnership with three entities uh, related to ferrets. Okay, along those lines, I wanted to talk about what, what happened at the South County Grasslands in 2021. We only have 52 acres of active prairie dog colonies. Um, I outlined to you guys in 2019's presentation that we had a die off late in the fall. Um, we, we basically are maintaining that same level of occupation since, 20, since late 2019 with 52 acres of active colonies. And you can see these colonies are shown here in the light purple. So this is despite our plague mitigation efforts, which, um, you know, we're happy that we're not losing all of our prairie dogs is kind of the hope out there right now and that they can recolonize quickly once we get everything under control with plague. Um, so we'll try to keep growing our colonies and stay focused on this area. We'll also be relocating prey dogs there in 2022. And again, I will outline that in just a second. Okay, so here's Rabbit Mountain, which is another area that's potential for ferret release. And it's our second largest HCA complex. So our acreage at Rabbit is, is staying fairly stable since 20, at, it stayed stable in 2021 as compared to 2020. So they're about the same. Um, we now have almost 1,100 acres. So this entire complex is around 5,000 acres and about a third of that acreage is suitable for prairie dogs. So with this continued success at Rabbit, we're encouraged about the potential future for ferrets here. Although if we put ferrets here, we'd be the only entity in charge of maintaining those ferrets. So partnerships are really good when it comes to something as complicated as ferrets. Um, so I wanted to just mention the colonies here are labeled with numbers as this was the map we used to distribute our SPV. So as a way to keep each colony straight, um, you have to measure out how much SPV goes on per acre and all that. So it's a little complicated. So we tried to break them out. Um, so, and along those lines, I wanted to mention that CPW has been our close partner on this, these SPV efforts since 2016. They help us distribute the SPV, plus actually combine the serum into the bait matrix for us annually. So this is a huge undertaking, and without this partnership, the cost of these efforts would be much higher. Plus, we always rely on their expertise in the many things we do across our properties with several parts of our overall wildlife program. So again, just a shout out to CPW. Okay, so I wanted to mention the Rock Creek Farm Management Plan process again. Um, we heard from you, many of you during the public process during this update, so we thank you. Um, you can see that this was updated in 2020. Um, so as a reminder, we will be relocating 40 acres of prairie dogs from Rock Creek Farm to the South County Grasslands in 2022. This is gonna bolster our population in that area. We estimate around 300 animals will be moved. We'll be using nest boxes for this effort. And the department has already allocated funds. Uh, and I will give you another update on how it went in our next year's presentation. 
Okay, and to illustrate what I just outlined, this map is pulled from the Rock Creek Farm Management Plan and shows the property acreage and the designations. The orange is NPD, the green is HCA, and the purple is MOA. So I specifically want to point out the HCA and MOA acres, the areas which are in the southern half of the property block. And the relocation, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here. Um, the relocation for 2022, I just mentioned, will be taken from the 40 acre MOA purple area and moved to the South County grasslands. Um, so again, I wanted to bring this up. This is the same area, but this is mapping for 2021 and 2020. And remember that the South part of Rock Creek Farm is MOA and HCA. So the orange areas are the 2020 mapped prairie dog colonies and the maroon areas of the 2021 map colonies. And you can see the significant change from last year to this year. So <clears throat> this is where we talk about what might have happened this year. We suspect that the precipitation this spring was ironically quite impactful to the prairie dogs in certain areas. We actually lost around 250 acres of occupied colonies at Rock Creek Farm due to the high vegetation response. The same situation happened elsewhere in the county and statewide, like including the Rocky Mountain Arsenal Wildlife Refuge. Um, so we think that perhaps the tall vegetation caused the prairie dogs to move because they don't like their visual area to be impaired by a tall vegetation. Um, also that tall vegetation can make predation easier. The predators can sneak up on them more effectively and have more success in taking them out. So um, again, we learn more and more about prairie dogs with each annual variation. Um, so yeah, a blessing in disguise, all that precipitation as far as prairie dogs. Okay, so more time for questions. So Susan and Rob, um, there's a couple that have come in on the Q&A that I thought I would um, kick off for you guys to answer because at least one of them we said we would answer live um, because I thought it was a really, I mean, they've all been great questions and comments. So, so let me first state that and I appreciate people um, using this Q&A feature. Uh, and so we'll maybe answer a couple of those and then um, I will open it up to the participants and folks can, um, when we do that, you can raise your hand and then I'll call on you live here. So the first one was, there was a, a question about what's our, our department's process for um, making those initial designations of properties um, and considering whether they should be classified as MOA, MPD, or HCA? And then is there a process for how we would change, um, a, once we've made a designation, is there a process for how we would make that change? Do, Rob or Susan, would one of you want to talk talk through that? Sure. Uh, Susan, if I miss anything, fill in. Um, yeah, our, our, when we... Typically, we do designations when we make new ac acquisitions or at the time a property is acquired. And we get familiar with that property and the resources on that property. And then we have very specific criteria outlined in the, in the prairie dog element of the management plan that um, defines the conditions and uh, uh, character of uh, characteristics of MOA, NPD, and uh, uh, HCA. So we, when we have a new acquisition, Susan and I and other staff get together um, after getting familiar with the property and we compare to the criteria, we have discussion um, and uh, those designations happen uh, uh, on our level. And then maybe Susan, uh, you can uh, maybe speak a little bit as to the formal process uh, in getting those formalized at, at, uh, at a, an update of the policy. Thanks, yeah, Rob. so that's a good summary. Um, we, you know, many people on staff meet and talk about the properties that we've acquired. And then depending on, you know, if it's irrigated cropland, it's NPD. If it's um, maybe grazing, land, then that might be MOA. It depends on sort of its proximity to other properties and what their use is. Um, but 
Yeah, so as far as like officially, there is a, um, a database of each property and its designation. And some properties can be half NPD and half MOA. And let's not forget that. It's not a straight up parcel level. It, we get pretty fine tuned about it. Um, so that goes into our GIS database and that's updated. We try it annually, but sometimes it's every other year. Um, but yeah, that's how it's, that's how it works. Great, thanks. Um, would it be, when, um, did we get at the question of uh, if something has a designation and then we would want to change that? Um, yeah, we do. We have changed uh, property designations in the past. And Rob and I um, often talk that we need to, you know, do a full on review again at some point. Um, but say, like we've got critical wildlife, here's an example, like at AHI, the complex, we have critical wildlife habitat that's designated to the west of Lagerman Reservoir. And so Rob and I met a few years ago. And again, like I said, we fine tune. Okay. Um, yeah. And we changed, you know, we changed some to MOA there uh, based on what our management objectives were for that area. That's great. Perfect. And I would I would just add that typically there's not a lot of changes. Um, the characteristics of the land uh, typically um, fit into those categories and there's not a lot of changes. But the, the example that Susan gave was a good example. Okay. Um, so not big changes, but but there are and have been changes and we do review from time to time to see if something should should be changed. Okay, very good. Um, one last one that I'm pulling from the Q&A section, at least at this point, and then um, again, participants, if you would like to ask your question live, I'm hoping you have a feature that, yes, that, that you have your hand raised. I see now that, that we do have some folks with that. So I'll start calling on you after I ask this last question, which came in through the Q&A, which was um, a, a person concerned about the use of Delta dust. And I wondered if, if um, somebody on our staff could describe a, a bit about the application. Um, one of the things that I was thinking of, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I might have thought that when we do a Delta dust application on a colony, we were um, applying it across a vast swath of, of, of property, but I believe those are really pretty targeted uh, applications um, to the, just to areas around the boroughs, but I'm wondering if um, one of our staff people could speak. Hi, Amy. I can, I can certainly answer that. Um, yes, uh, there was always, of course, secondary effects um, with, with amphibians, insects, etc. cetera. Uh, we do try to really minimize those impacts by getting the dust down into the burrow as far as possible. Uh, we do not dust anywhere near um, any kind of water, whether it be an irrigation ditch, uh, dry or wet. Um, and we also make sure to um, alleviate any uh, uh, spreading of that dust with um, weather events, i.e. high winds, um, snow, rain, etc. cetera. Um, we always like to allow that dust to dry down in there for um, over 24 hours before continuing on. Great. Thanks very much, Amy. That's, that's awesome. All right. So now um, I, we have three hands raised. I'm going to uh, start to... Um, promote those people so they can ask their questions live here. Uh, the first person on the list is Patricia Bicklin. So I'm gonna, um, again, promote you and allow you to talk. Um, I believe you should now be able to. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, well, first of all, I appreciate being invited and I must say Rob and actually, I Amy, I recognize you. I've, I've enjoyed actually talking and working with you, all of you. But the main reason I'm on here is, is the issue of the damage to my property, as well as the damage to uh, my cattle. Um, I actually quickly went over my records in the last three years. I've actually had to euthanize about 18 cattle that have stepped in holes and been injured. And I've dealt with Amy and a few years ago, you know, uh, she spent a lot of time out at my property, and, and I think that there was some type of movement to try to control um, 
they're preserved, but they they found a burrowing owl, and I appreciate that. But I, I guess I'm on here, and I and and I'm not the only neighbor. I I kind of found out about this uh, meeting late, but there's at least four or five other neighbors that I you know tried to get on, and they've got other things going on, including the Highland ditch company oh okay. i just want it and and so i do control the prairie dogs um amy referred me to somebody i also use another professional company to prairie dog but it doesn't really matter what i do i go through lethal kills two three times a year and each and every year i have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more um uh, holes um and they so i so i live you know next to the highlands so they're all, you know, in the area that's just north of the Highland Ditch. They're now running on the Highland Lake because I was a little late getting them. They kind of come through to my property through Bob Combs' property, who lives just next door to me. They are now moving across the street, you know, across 83rd into a housing development too. So with all due respect, you know, in your program, which I do, respect i really need i need some kind of resolution to keep the dogs onto you guys's property yeah that's a great comment um and i i i can you know that it it as we get into the specifics about a situation we'll we'll probably need to take that offline and work with you but you know solutions could be buffers um and and I don't know, you know, it's possible that that uh, well, I don't know if, if anybody on our staff would want to make any more comments no, about I, that. But but we definitely hear your concerns, and it sounds like we've, um, you know, tried to work on that over the years. So well, mean yeah. Rob, you know what? Not to butt in here, and I and I I I I do appreciate what you're saying, but the reality of the situation is is that that nothing is being done. And okay. I have brought this up for many, many, many years, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. There's my property doesn't even border you. It it's borders another property that's that's very affected. And the thing is, is that you know I uh, the minute that Highland, the minute that one of those dogs burrows a hole through the irrigation ditch, you've got another problem. But like I said, I, I'm bringing this up because I feel that I've contacted so many people within your program and yeah. Amy's been out there and I, I, I've, I've really exhausted in trying to contact you to, to do something. And again, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. My property is being ruined. My fence line is screwed up and my animals are, are being injured and or, and or killed. Okay. Um, so it's a huge loss to me. And yeah, again, I, you have all the rights to preserve them all you want, but I, what I want to know is, is do you have the right to, do they have the right to encroach on other people's property and, and ruin their property and their livelihood and their animals? Well, you know, Patty, I, um, thanks for, for your comments. We, and, yeah. and I, I will be, you know, getting in touch with you to address your specific situation. Um, uh, and, and so, Amy and I can visit with you. We'll come out and, and take a look. We are aware of what's going on out there. You have a little bit of a unique situation, but in general, um, to the neighbor question, we have lots of neighbors and we realize um, uh, there are impacts to neighbors. And in general, we try to work with our neighbors on an individual basis and situation. We put up a, a, one of the primary ways is that we address it is with um, barriers constructing barriers cooperating on constructing barriers we we have done removal efforts um, part part of the story is too we are uh, we are spread thin to a degree and we are trying to get to uh, uh, our neighbors uh, to the extent we can we put a lot of resources into it um, I know for now that's not helping you with your situation now but um, that's the reality and we will, we will be up, I'll be in contact with you. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned within, by the uh, middle of January, we'll, we'll arrange to come up and look at your situation and see what, 
what we can do. All right. All right, thanks, Patricia. I'm gonna move us along. If you have another question, feel free to raise your hand again, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, next in line is Dana Bovey. And uh, let's see, I, Dana, I think you should be able to speak. Okay. Yep, we can hear you. All righty. Um, first thing is, I. You know, I asked in chat, but I just one of the things I'm curious about is I didn't hear anything about some of the decisions that were made at, at Holmberg after the whole Holmberg planning process. Um, it was an understanding that there was going to be research. Um, there was it seemed like there was going to be some announcement or announcement to the public about what, you know, how the the prairie dogs would be removed, what the plan is based on, you know, what information, what science, what have you. And I must have missed that. Was that, you know, was that put out, that information put out somewhere that the public could access? Um, um, oh, go ahead. I, yeah, so Danny, you're right. Um, my goal was to get some literature review done and try to figure out how to maintain prairie dogs in that southeast corner, um, but also allow the grasslands to recover to some extent. But we were thrown a curveball with the high precipitation this spring, and you saw how many prairie dogs, how much of a contraction we had in their um, colonies this year. So it was unexpected. And so it's sort of like, we're sort of wrestling with how do we maintain those areas with the less density of prairie dogs on them. Um, so it's kind of, we swapped positions where we had a lot of prairie dogs and now we have very few. So we're kind of wrangling with that right now. Well, I'm, I'm a little concerned in that, um, you know, number one, that didn't seem to be a follow-up on what was promised, um, you know, in terms of at least what we heard during the planning process and two, you know, it, it's, it all sounds to be about precipitation and, and tall grasses, but you guys planted all those tall grasses in there in, in June. Um, and I didn't hear anything about that either. Well, I think that um, what we can do is release to the public our plans for our revegetation, um, but that the area in the HCA that I'm talking about the southeast corner, that's all native vegetation response. We didn't plant in there. You're thinking of the MOA areas probably. We did plant uh -huh. one area of MOA, but the rest uh -huh. of the MOA was not planted. So again, it's it's about communicating what we've done and what our plans are into the future. So yeah. So the other part, you know, briefly is, you know, I brought this up to Jeff as well. And you know, there's a discussion about this being an adaptive process, um, you know, because changes are happening, you know, not just on open space, but surrounding as well. And what we've, you know, we brought up, you know, the last few years is, and we brought up an example at, you know, of it, you know, south, south part of Rabbit Mountain is a concern just like over near the, on the Braley property by the hygiene nest. Um, not we're not looking for a change on all the MOA lands in terms of the language that that's in there on MOA that would allow up to 99.9% .9 removal of prairie dogs. Um, the language is there to do that. Our concern is that, you know, Jeff says, well, we haven't done that in 22 years, but what's the guarantee that that might not happen at some, you know, some property like, you know, where there's a, a great dependence on those prairie dogs, like at, you know, around the hygiene nest where you have golden eagles, wintering frugious hawk, bald eagles, um, and then also at, at you know, at, at south, south of Rabbit Mountain where, you know, we just, you know, we discovered a communal roost there, not with, not only bald eagles, but we've, you know, we've also seen, you um, you know, two or three frugious hawks also roosting in that area. And that's, you know, and that's designated as an MOA within a, you know, within a half a mile of that roost, um, which again, 
you know, could be allowed to, you know, to remove up to 99 or more percent of those prairie dogs. Why in, in certain areas is there no flexibility at all um, to look at that language? Well, I think the answer there is um, just like there is for all aspects of our management, not all of it is covered by written policy. And you have, you know, 150 professionals here at Boulder County Parks and Open Space that are doing our best to manage those properties for the public trust. So I guess I guess I would say that the that that there are there could be a number of things that people could ask us about the management of the landscape that isn't covered in a policy. And I guess I guess part of my response, Dana, and, and you've heard us talk about this before, um, is that this is not a, a, a an area where we feel like um, we need to make a change in the policy. We've we've been able to address these issues as they've come up. And the way the policy is written now provides us kind of the flexibility that we need, I guess. So I- Can I add I something? Can I add something specific? Yeah. Uh, yeah, please do, Susan. And then I'm gonna move us to the next um, couple of questioners after you respond, okay. Susan, just okay. so we can kind of keep us moving along and get to the last section. So go ahead, Susan. Well, so related to the Rabbit Mountain area and the roost sites, um, that area is really important for raptors, we get it. Rabbit Mountain is one of our, we're doing plague mitigation there across the whole landscape of that 5,000 acres of the Rabbit Mountain complex. So definitely the raptors are responding. Um, so that I feel like is, um, we're doing really good there. The South County grasslands is also incredibly important for raptors and we're trying to grow our colonies there with you know, plague mitigation and also relocations. So you know, those are the areas of focus for us to grow our colonies as big as we can for ferrets and for raptors. So again, it's a balance across our landscape of where we prioritize HCAs and MOAs are also part of our conservation. Um, we don't prioritize MOAs for removals. So that's why I present information on HCA and MOAs together because they make up the whole story of conservation but as Jeff alluded to, we do need flexibility on MOAs at times. Um, yeah. So yeah, it gives us flexibility and I understand your concerns, but I, I think it's all part of the same conservation conversation with MOAs and HCAs. Okay, well, thank you. And, and if you can get any word out on what's going on in Holmberg, Susan, that would yeah. be great. All right, thank you, Dana, for your questions and, if, and comments. And if you have another question, um, we can address it later. I'm going to move on okay, to no give problem, some more You bet. Um, so next up is Stephen Myrick. And let's see. Can Stephen, are you there? I'm here. Oh, great. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to make my comments because I do want to, as part of it, I wanted to comment about the moratorium. Is that something you want comments on later? Um, you know, we're probably unless you have a, a reason you won't be around in let's say 15 or 20 minutes, that's probably when we'll take most of those questions right. and comments. Right. Then I will I will pass them and join and comment then. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, all right. So then it looks like we're next up is David Kelly. David, do, are you there? I'm here. Oh, great. Do you have a question or comment for us on, on our gonna, last year's management? I'm gonna follow in the footsteps of Mr. Myricks. My uh, questions and concerns are also about the moratorium period. So I'll defer at this point and we'll okay. ask the question in the later session, but thank you. Okay, all right. It won't take us long. We'll be there uh, before you know it. Um, so actually you can probably just keep your hand up if you want. I think we've gone through all the raised hands. Um, I think, it, I wanted to just address one more thing in the q and It looks like we're up to uh, probably over 30 questions now. We will, we will um, try to keep answering those as we are going through the meeting. It's also possible that we may have to answer some of those after the meeting and um, we'll get back to you. Um, and, and perhaps while I'm um, talking about our moratorium, 
uh, perhaps some of some more of those Q&A questions will be answered by our other staff. So let's, uh, so let's see. Oh, I see, I, I got one more hand up. So let me, let me, um, uh, let me see if that person has a comment about our 21, 2021, Ron Robel. Uh, are you there, Ron? Here. Oh, good. Do you have a question about our uh, uh, I have a comment, uh, and it directed uh, towards Rob. Uh, last spring, you were out, uh, and I'd, I'm a neighbor to the uh, IBM uh, open space. And last year, it was pretty much a moonscape. And I know you worked hard on it this year to get rid of a lot of the prairie dogs. There's still a lot left, even though it's an NPD. Uh, but I appreciate that. It has given me some relief from all the invaders. Uh, and I know you're gonna keep working on it with uh, Tenant Larry. So uh, I just wanna shout out that I appreciate that, that you've given me some and the pasture has recovered uh, quite a bit from the moonscape that it was. And I think uh, continue working on it. And then I'll also have a comment later on about the moratorium. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Ron, appreciate your comment, and we'll hear from you again here in a second or in a couple minutes. Um, all right, so I think we've gone through all of the attendee raised hands, and we're I'm going to assume we're at a pretty good spot with the Q and A. So let's let's just talk about the moratorium for just a little bit, and then we'll open it up to all uh, you know to questions about that specifically. So go ahead, Sue. Thank you. <laughs> And I think you might be able to advance through one more slide pretty quickly here. Yep, go to the, then we'll go to the next one here. So one of the things that, that um, based on our, our discussions and presentations from earlier this evening, one of the things that staff has, has looked at is, um, would the removal of this lethal control moratorium language from the current plan, um, would that give us an ability to, to perform management, uh, especially on NPD areas um, with more effect and allow us to um, create, do what those NPD areas are asking us to do, what, what they're classified to be, which is no prairie dog areas. And, um, and so this is the section of the plan that would be addressed. And, and you can, you know, this is, I'm just pulling it right from the web today. Um, and so what we're looking at here is right now we have this time frame where we're not, um, we're not able to do lethal control from March 1 to May 31st. And so this is the, this is the section of the policy. I just wanted to highlight this. So let's go to the next slide, Susan. So from a staff perspective, uh, one of the things that we feel would the, the removal of the moratorium would do would be that in the end, it would result in fewer deaths of prairie dogs and provide better overall control. What, um, and I might let other staff uh, get in, explain this in a little bit more detail, but what the spring moratorium ends up doing is allowing a lot of births of prairie dogs that then really um, increases that population, especially if you recall Rob's discussion about the AHI property where prairie dogs are, um, we get them under control, but then during this moratorium time frame, they expand into areas again. We are faced with going back and removing them from areas that we had previously done. Um, and so from a staff perspective, we really feel like uh, removing the moratorium would allow us to achieve the control that, that the plan is really asking us to do. Um, and then what that control does is then it allows us to reduce the impacts that are happening to our ag properties and, and in effect to our tenants operations. Um, let's see the next slide, Susan. Um, and so we have, as you've heard, uh, and you've heard us talk about it, and then you've heard uh, some of our neighbors explain how we haven't been able to get at um, the same level or the level of control that they'd like to see us. 
Um, so we just have had trouble successfully clearing these uh, no prairie dog areas of, of prairie dogs with this moratorium. And so we're gonna make this request to lift the moratorium. So with that, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so we're, we're gonna um, propose this. Um, we've, we've got a public process for this proposed change. And I believe that this will be open tomorrow um, with a public comment form. And so you'll be able to provide us your comments on the web on this page here, captured here on this slide, um, and let us know how you feel about this. And uh, the item is scheduled right now to be in front of POSAC in, at their January regular meeting, and then we'll have a follow-up and take it to the county commissioners at a later date. We don't have a final date for that. So I think that's just a really brief, uh, my brief summary of what we're looking to do. Day, uh, excuse me, Susan or Rob or any other staff, would you like to provide any other background on reasons for why we'd like to see the moratorium or shall we just open to questions at this point? I'll just try to say briefly that um, for a long time, we have tracked very closely and very accurately every removal activity that we perform, all trapping, all direct lethal control, whether by carbon compressed carbon monoxide or cartridges. Um, we trapped the hours, we trapped all acreages, all aspects. And over the years, we have, as we look at the data, we have just seen that a pattern of... Um, retreating properties over and over and over again. Um, and we are in the moratorium period, not being able to treat during that period for a number of reasons uh, is, is one of the times when we really lose a lot of ground. Um, environmental conditions such as air temperatures, soil moisture um, are, are pretty good during that period. Um, yeah, we do get shut down by spring storms, but typically uh, that, that's for short periods of time. Um, so yeah, we, we, our goals for, for removal really long-term are we want to, our NPD properties, uh, the removal activities are just simply maintenance. Hey, real quick question for you. I'm getting Not a major you. effort. Not a major effort. Uh, machine to gas them dogs. Hmm. What would that what that machine cost? Well, they, there's different from fourteen to seventeen thousand dollars for what a couple couple years. No, they they've been lasting. Okay. Well, right. we needed. Thank you. Thanks. Anyway, the the bottom line is, uh, we want to uh, get on top of. Uh, removal on our NPD property. So it's reduced to a maintenance activity only. And instead of treating 30,000 barrels a year, or, uh, you know, we're down to four or 5,000 barrels. That's, that's really where we're trying to get. And we, we believe that um, if, if we continue the moratorium period, it's going to make that uh, much more difficult to reach that point, take much longer. Okay, Susan, anything to add to that, Mike? Jeff, can, can I, I'd like to add a Please. quick thought um, to build off of Rob's point. Rob, thanks so much. You, you, I think you made a very elegant point. And um, I just wanna add that in the, the context of our agricultural land, so um, right now, each year we spend about 20% of our agricultural revenues on prairie dogs that take up less than 5% of our agricultural lands. So thinking about this from a, a dollars and cents standpoint, we're spending 20% of our agricultural revenues on prairie dogs that, that are on less than 5% of those NPD lands. So from my perspective, this is way out of balance. And to Rob's first point, our goal is to um, treat fewer prairie dogs in the long run. And by uh, eliminating this moratorium, as Rob mentioned, we will be able to do that in, in a few years and get to a place where we can be in maintenance mode. And uh, I wanna be really clear, we're not talking about treating prairie dogs on the MOAs or the HCAs where this moratorium is to 
be specific so we're treating on only those NTD lands. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, unless Susan wants to add anything, we'll go back to the live questions or comments. Susan, do you have anything you want to mention or? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. We probably could even, um, you could maybe even stop sharing your screen if you'd like. Or we can hover on the questions. That's fine too. Um, so let's let's see. Let's go back to Stephen Myrick, and I think I've got you unmuted, Stephen. If you want to offer your comment or question. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you bet. Uh, um, you asked about. Uh, I live um, uh, in uh, unincorporated Boulder County, very near the AHI Lagerman property. Rob okay. knows me. Rob knows me quite well. I'm okay. on that. I'm on that property a lot. I'm also a POSAC member, but I'm yeah. not here to speak on behalf of POSAC. Yeah. I want to speak as strongly as I can in favor of this moratorium. It's long yeah. overdue uh, ending the moratorium. We, uh, I see this property uh, constantly. I ride it constantly on my horse. I hike it. And I've seen Rob and his crews out there. And this is a never ending a uh, cycle of rolling the rock up the hill and watching it roll back over you. Um, it, to call this a, I think you would call it a Sisyphean task is to put it, is to put it nicely. And I wanna speak as strongly as I can in support of the ending of the moratorium as the staff is suggesting. I also wanna say that I do appreciate the efforts that the county's making. I'm talking specifically of uh, on these areas, uh, including the barrier fencing that was done along 63rd. I appreciate that. But I think this policy is long overdue for a change and uh, will be ultimately quite beneficial. And as you point out, I, uh, you know, result in uh, a lot less work in the future. I see Rob's crews out there with the machines constantly. I ride by those areas in a few months uh, or later in the same year. And I see the return of uh, in those NPD areas. I also know the um, the farmer uh, who is a tenant there. I know him pretty well, and I know the struggles he he's had. So I just want to say I think this is a long overdue uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, you know the one thing uh, I I just needed to, a couple of uh, housekeeping things here for me to help help. Um, things stay under control. However, we've got 10 raised hands now. And so, um, and so if you, uh, some of them might be from before. So if you don't want to speak on this particular topic now, maybe uh, put your hand down. But if you'd like to speak on it, we really do want to hear from you. And I'll just start calling on new people here first. Um, and then with the number of people we have, I'm going to ask maybe if people can keep their comments to maybe three to five minutes um, or less, if that's okay, just to be sensitive to the rest of us for our, our uh, for our evening here. So, um, so yeah, if you, if I'm gonna, it looks like we have a couple people at the top of the list that still have their hand up and I will come back to you um, after we hear from people that we haven't heard from yet. So next on the list is Lindsay Sterling Crank. And so I think I've got you, uh, can you, yeah. Can you hear me okay? We sure can, Lindsay. Hi, Hi welcome. Thanks. I uh, remember when the moratorium was started and it was because um, some folks were on a Boulder County property and the removal effort um, was not very successful. And some citizens came across a borough where an adult female and her pups were trying to crawl out of a burrow that had been treated and they were all dying and suffering above ground. And it was not okay. It, depending on who you are on this call, um, it, was a, it was a cruel and it was an inhumane moment to be a part of. And it wasn't, it wasn't okay to see an animal suffering like that. So that I respect why the moratorium was initiated. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is why the exception in the moratorium um, isn't working. You have an exception in there that says um, 
except for individuals attempting to colonize an NPD without prairie dogs. If these areas are free of prairie dogs as of March 1 of each year, direct lethal control may be used to prevent recolonization during this time period. And the reason the exception was written into the moratorium was to um, prevent the situations and the repeated control that Rob and his crew are talking about. So why is that not working? Because I think we all wanna prevent you know, as many prairie dogs as possible from suffering that way. And that's why it was happening because it was a pup season. And we thought, you know, three months of, you know, no harassment to an animal um, so that they can rear their young um, in a way where they're not being persecuted was ethical. So why is the exception where you can kill prairie dogs on non-prairie do prairie dogs already on NPDs already, it's a part of the moratorium, not working? Can um, okay, good question, um, Lindsay. D um, Rob, Amy, or did uh, Rob, Rob or Amy? Did, yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot, and then Amy, you can. Okay, uh, between the two of us, I think we can address this, and Susan may have more to add. Um, that Lindsay, that um, uh, reoccupation happened so quickly that we can't get ahead of it. Um, that that's that's part of it. The other part is toward the end of the moratorium, um, there is a dispersal going on uh, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, yearling males that, again, it happens so quickly and in uh, uh, the numbers overwhelm us. We, we can't, we can't uh, keep up with it. Amy, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. you um, see it. Lindsay, I mean, you're well versed, you know how how they move and how this works. Um, you know, what we're really seeing is that a lot of the colonies that we uh, treat year after year, um, you know, neighboring pastures, whether it be, you know, private, public, uh, uh, city open spaces, um, we're really seeing a huge influx in the last several years, uh, which we have not seen in the past like that. Um, also like to point out that, you know, um, because we don't treat during the moratorium, um, it's just me um, out there by myself trying to kind of upkeep all of these places. Um, uh, also, you know, weather events such as snow, et cetera, kind of put us down for, for a little bit. But, you know, honestly, Lindsay, I mean, it, it, it would take an army, um, as you know, to do it in that time frame that we were given at this point, and, and we just don't have that. Okay. All right, thank you, um, Amy and Rob, and thank you, Lindsay, for your question. If you have another one, um, you know, keep your hands raised and we'll come back to you. I'm gonna move now to Michael Moss. Good evening, Michael. Good evening. Um, thank you all very much for um, this meeting tonight. Um, I am a tenant on multiple open space parcels. And, you know, as a tenant, I, I'm not bound by the moratorium. And it's it's been very um, educational for me trying to manage the prairie dogs that are constantly encroaching um, on my properties um, that when we have the opportunity to uh, treat a hole as soon as it's found or when they um, start to create a colony, it really minimizes um, uh, the amount of treatments that I have to do. And by taking um, uh, the treatment process out of, um, uh, out of the realm of possibility for the staff for three months when they are really moving and uh, uh, really breeding is just getting us to fall farther and farther behind and having more and more damage on our, our ground. So um, you know, as an ag tenant, I'm, I'm very supportive of this change in um, uh, the policy. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, let's see here. Um, it looks like next we have uh, Suzanne Webble. Good evening, Suzanne. Hello. Can you hear me? We sure can. Hi. Okay, so I live on the east slope of Table Mountain, 
between there and 63rd Street on a farm that is sandwiched between prairie dogs from OSMP to the north and <laughs> an incursion of prairie dogs from AHI, Boulder County Park Service Base to the east. Um, and I appreciate staff having worked really hard to get ahead of the massive diaspora of prairie dogs on irrigated agricultural lands, including my own. Your slide talked about the benefits of um, lifting the moratorium for the county and for tenants, but it's also for the benefit of neighbors. And I would love to see you add that to your slide the next time you show it. Um, anyhow, so I think staff needs all the help they can get to keep making progress uh, and and the moratorium has prevented them from from making keeping that progress, keeping a hold on it, and they just keep backsliding. Like Steve Myrick said, that was a great analogy. Um, so I support removing the moratorium so they can get ahead of the prairie dogs where we've all agreed they need to be eliminated. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, let's see here. Next, it looks like it's uh, Scott Miller. Hi, Scott. Yep. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can. Yeah, that, um, yeah I, uh, I guess as a tenant for man, 20 years, give or take, down at Rock Creek, um, I've seen this whole thing work firsthand. I was actually the first tenant that was allowed to do any prairie dog control on an open space property ahead of the policy that got set. And the moratorium doesn't work. Uh, you know, it's because that's when the pups are being reared. Uh, you know, you you basically shut your you shut everybody down at the time when you know, your prairie dog numbers are getting ready to explode and when they get on the move. And so you, it's like letting it, all the animal, you know, it's like a, having a, you know, a pet store and letting all the animals out and then having to clean them up. You know, it's just, it, it doesn't work. And the policy was flawed from the beginning. It, 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 it got it twisted off of a, you know, um, call out a Department of Wildlife policy that says that because the pups are being reared during that time, that you cannot trap during May through June with or March through June without doing following it with lethal control to make sure you don't leave orphan pups in the in the burrows. But all everybody does lethal control anyway, so it was a. Oh, we might have lost Scott. Scott, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can again. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I lost you there. Um, but anyway, but yeah, I mean, the policy needs to go away. It just isn't, it isn't a sound policy. It, you know, we can't, you know, you're just asking us, like Stephen said, you know, you know, we're trying to solve a, you know, you know, bail out a boat with a thimble. It just doesn't work. And you got to, we need those three months to make a dent in things and keep our progress going forward, controlling prairie dogs on these MPD areas. Got it. All right. Th any more, Scott? Thanks. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thanks very much. All right, next on the list is Elizabeth Black. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, can you hear me? We can. All right. Um, yeah, um, I don't like killing things, and I don't know anybody who does like killing things. Um, but I think this is kind, kind of a math problem. I'm into math. And um, if you keep the moratorium in place, it me, to me, looking at the numbers and the population, way populations um, work, it looks like you're just going to have to kill even more prairie dogs. Um, I think the point is to try and kill fewer prairie dogs in the long run. And by getting rid of the moratorium, I think that's what's going to happen. 
because you won't have to be going back over and over again and killing more and more and more prey dogs that have repopulated during that moratorium period. So um, I think that um, getting rid of the moratorium is a good idea because it means that fewer prairie dogs will be killed in the long run. That's it. Okay, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Uh, next up is Ron Robel. Hi. I was up earlier. I uh, deferred this to later because I'm in favor of uh, getting rid of the moratorium as a neighbor to an NPD. Okay. Uh, I watch uh, staff try to control them during the rest of the year. And then the explosion happens in the spring. And I'm affected by that. And it just doesn't make any sense that we're, you know, like Elizabeth said, we're just raising them to kill them. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that brings us to Kent Hambleton. Hello, Kent, are you there? I can't, there, there you go. Mute button. My we can hear you now, Kent. Okay, great. So uh, I live next to some open space and I've been here for two years and uh, I have observed what has already been reported that uh, last year uh, we had an increase in the population and this year it's been lower just by natural occurrences. And uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I wanna thank you guys for what you do. And um, I wanted to say that um, it seems like uh, overall, based on the pie chart you showed at the beginning of the presentation, you guys are actually working on increasing the population of prairie dogs overall. And, um, and that uh, what we're talking about is a very small percentage of properties that have uh, this policy of no prairie dogs. And, um, and I just wanna be uh, clear that I support the moratory, uh, removing the moratorium, um, because if you're, if, because you're going, you're, you, you've already been authorized uh, to, to kill prey dogs and whether you're, I, I'm sorry, but whether you're killing um, uh, grown up prairie dogs or baby prey dogs, you're still killing prey dogs. And, and so uh, I don't see how limiting you from the, three most important months of killing is going to change things. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Kent. Appreciate your comments. Um, let's see. So that brings us to Robert O'Donnell. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can. Hi, guys. Thank you. So I'm Robert O'Donnell. Um, I've, I've talked with you guys quite a few times, uh, Rob Alexander and I, and I, I want to reiterate what Patricia, Patricia said earlier, and then um, okay. the couple of young ladies mentioned, I, I do support getting rid of the, mator the moratorium. The reason is, is I am a neighbor and the collateral damage guys to my property. And I've said this now, I've, I've lived on the Brubaker Sorensen property for 32 years. I built my house there 17 years ago. I have prairie dogs in my septic field. I have prairie dogs in my lawn. I have prairie dogs in my backyard. I have horses. I've lost a third of my hay. The moratorium would be helpful. Rob and those guys are out there every year. They're doing what they can. Besides the prairie dogs, I have thistle. It just goes on and on and on. And I, I want to reiterate what the young lady said also. In, 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 in your policies and your standards and all that, Nothing is very is ever spoken about neighbors, 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 neighbors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I know you talk about barrier fences and all that, but we talk about this and we say this, you guys have to be better neighbors. And, and I hope getting rid of this moratorium will help me as my property suffers. I, I, I'm putting dollars in trying to 
take care of these prairie dogs that are not supposed to be there. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks very much for your comments, appreciate it. All right, so let's see here. Um, let me do just a little bit of a regroup here. Um, while we're doing that, I see we, we have, we have many questions. We are going to, um, on the Q&A, so we'll, we will be uh, either answering some of these questions if we still can um, this evening. Otherwise, we will uh, get back to people. And for those of you that have, um, let's see, for those of you that, that would like Q&A questions answered after we close the meeting, if we haven't answered them, um, you can reach me um, by going to the county's website about prairie dogs. My uh, email address is on there and you can let me know what your email address is and then we can uh, reply back to you if we don't answer uh, all of your questions here in the Q&A. While maybe um, some of our staff can be answering a couple of those, I'm just gonna make sure one more time we don't have any more participants. Um, and I'm gonna probably, I might have to, either if you, if you want, if you can lower your hand, but if you have it up still, I'm gonna start calling on you. So um, I am going to, so Patricia Vicklin, I'm gonna um, see if you wanna add something from your previous comments. Do you, Patricia, would you have no, anything? Actually, actually, that was an accident. I don't know why I okay. hit that button. I'm, <laughs> I said okay. everything I need to say, thank you. Okay, thank you. No worries. Um, let's see. So next is David Kelly. Do you have anything you would like to add to your previous comments or not? Yes, I would like to add to those. Great. Um, I concur with, I think the majority of the people here of removing the moratorium uh, for all of those valid reasons, but I would like to add some of the economic impact to the operators, the tenants. Uh, we do have a property the AHI, and with this moratorium in place, as it's already been explained, the population has exploded on our property and reintroduced themselves in areas that were previously treated and cleaned up pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems with that is, as the prairie dogs come in, you all know this, the grass goes away, weeds have come in, and over the last two years, we have, in the last year particularly, we have sprayed and it's about 80 to 100 acres of that property, about 10 to 15% of it. And we have sprayed the property twice. We then went out and worked the property and seeded it into grass uh, to reestablish the, the grass that was previously there. And then we turn on the sprinklers and the irrigation and have a pump bill to water it. And between the seed, the sprinkler, and the fertilizer, we've spent probably an additional 10 to $15,000 a year trying to reestablish grass that was previously there. If that grass had been reestablished, we would have permanent grazing and haying that we could harvest crops off. Of. But because we can't, it's impacting us by 10 to 15% of the acreage. It's impacting us by 10 to 15% of the animals. We run a cow-calf herd there. So we're losing production of 10 to 15% of the animals. We just sold some calves recently and they averaged 770 pounds at about a buck 40. Well, if you do the quick math, that's over a thousand dollars a head. So if we've mm -hmm. lost 10 to 15% of our herd production, that's 10 to 15 animals a year. There's another 10 to 15,000. So we've got 10 to 15,000 in expense. We've got 10 to 15,000 in lost revenues. And as Rob put earlier, those guys are excellent to work with, but they're stretched so thin, they just can't get around to it. And our property is a prime example of that explosive reintroduction of prairie dogs as they expand. We're trying to assist in the county with that. We went out and bought our own machine to uh, mitigate prairie dogs. And that cost us another $16,000 that's out of our pocket. And we went through the training. We work in cooperation with Boulder County Open Space. We're doing everything we can, but it's a very expensive, you know, there's $30,000 that's impacting our bottom line because of problems like this. So, you know, that's, that's my input on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. All right. Um, 
uh, I've looked at the Q and A with our staff. I, I think we've answered most of the questions. And uh, Jeff, Jeff, oh, one one question. Uh, Ruby um, has a, has a a really great question. Um, I think okay. Susan would be best to answer that. Um, I think Susan can now see the Q and A. So, Do you, Amy, would you want to read it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Ruby is asking about the uh, Carolyn Holmberg Preserve 40 acres. Uh, will all of the 300 prairie dogs in field seven at Carolyn Holmberg Preserve be re relocated in 2022? Parks and Open Space is proposing to kill more prairie dogs on county land on NPDs by eliminating the moratorium. When will the county increase the number of relocations it does each year? It is only fair. Um, so Ruby, to answer that question, um, we are shooting to get all of the prairie dogs out of the 40 acre preserve and moved to the South County grasslands to bolster our populations there. Um, so that's the goal, definitely. Um, uh, we haven't done a uh, relocation for a while, so this is the first one we'll be doing. Um, so we'll see how it goes. And yeah, it might be something that we explore more into the future. Um, We'll see how this one plays out. And yeah, I see your point. Yeah. And it's another tool in our toolbox, relocations. Yeah. And just, uh, I mean, um, I might keep you on the, the meeting here for just a second, Susan. One of the things I've learned in the last few years is relocations are not necessarily simple. We, we uh, and I know Ruby um, already understands this, but for people that might not know, I mean, one of the reasons we don't just do you know, many, many, many relocations is they also cost money, um, take staff time. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, they are complex. Uh, am I getting that right, Susan? Would you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely true. Um, it can be traumatic to the animals as well, but um, we are very careful in our relocations, but yeah, it is um, quite complicated for sure. Yep. But we, have, but, but, and then all that said, we have tried to keep um, that aspect of our management as as an option for us as well to to try and do that. So yeah, good question, um, Ruby. Thank you, Susan and Amy. Um, I have one more person with their hand raised, and then after that we uh, could be looking at concluding this meeting here. So next up and last on my list is Mark Locke. Mark, are you there? Hello, Mark. Looks like he's muted, maybe. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Welcome, Mark. Great. Thank, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for this session. Uh, I, I want to, you know, first uh, bring in a different uh, perspective that's been offered so far. We have uh, an ag conservation easement that's sandwiched in between public open spaces along Lagerman Reservoir and a residential community. And uh, I really want to thank Amy and her team in particular for just working, uh, you know, in, incredibly to help us kind of work our uh, issue here. We've lived on the property for seven years. And during that time, while we have done regular treating on the property virtually every year, and the county has been working on that, the number of holes has gone from 1,500 uh, holes to 2,200 holes on our 40 acres. And just to, I think it's a worthwhile consideration if you thought about a half acre property in the city, that would mean you'd be tolerating 25 prairie dog holes in your city uh, property, which I think would be unacceptable for anybody in that context. And I think the interesting thing here is living in between the public open space and the residential property, as soon as we can't control the prairie dogs on our property that keep coming in from the county properties, then our neighbors uh, call us up and tell us we need to get our prairie dogs off of their property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're forced into this dilemma of having to constantly kill prairie dogs, which we do not want to. I think, Elizabeth, your comments on this were really well placed. And we're doing it because, you know, we're not being a good neighbor in our uh, to the residential property owners that are close by if we're not dealing with this. So it, the spread just kind of goes even further over time. And there's one last comment. I think the farmers that are in our Boulder County community are remarkable in how they've tried to deal with this. And the question would be, what are you gonna do? What's the county gonna do uh, when the farmers get so fed up with the costs they have to incur to do this, that they decide they're not gonna continue to manage these properties? 
who's going to manage all that great open space property that uh, we really all love to see? Because that's, I think, part of what we're facing if we don't deal with these tough issues of raising and eliminating this moratorium. Yep, yep. I'm assuming that was kind of a rhetorical question there at the end, Mark. So, um, yeah, no, I, it, I actually, I, I will say it is a bit of a rhetorical question, but I think it's a real question too. It is. We do hear yeah. constantly of farmers talking about they are going to no longer do this, and there is a question about who will do that then, because that's just that's a right. personal cost to the property. Yep, great point, great point, and one one that we do consider, and um, you know, it's 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 for some of the reasons that that uh callers mentioned um are some of the reasons why our staff is making this recommendation so um thanks thank you and thank you to everybody for the great questions and comments this evening um i don't see aside from mark's hand i don't see anybody else with their hand raised so uh and i'm i'm thinking we've got most of the questions uh, answered and then all of the comments that that have been made on the Q and A are captured um, by us. And I think with that we can we can um, start to end the meeting. Again, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, staff. And um, as just a reminder, this we're going to be opening the the public comment period for this um, the removal of this uh, considering removal of this lethal control moratorium. And our website should be open tomorrow and you can start making your comments online to there. And then, as I mentioned, the first, uh, the first public meeting will be the POSAC meeting on January 27th. So with that, unless any staff has any final comments, I think we can um, end the meeting. Again, really just very appreciative of everybody's comments and attendance and participation. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, everybody. All right, we'll see you later.